Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everyone. My name is Yvonne I'm an alcoholic. Hi. And that's a Texas welcome. <laughs> I just, uh, I am so grateful to be here. Um, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that you're, you're not getting Eileen today, um, which would have been just a delight. You'll, you'll get her, her other half tonight, though. Um, but I'm, uh, I'm so grateful to be here. Um, I'd like to thank Stuart and um, Dave for having me here. And then I just have so many friends, you know, Danielle and Keith have opened their home to me. I, uh, I try to make Brownwood every year. I love Brownwood. Um, and I just, I love my people. I have so many friends here. Thank you, Danielle, Deb, Tracy. I, I have to be careful because she, Oh God. Mallory, sorry, Ian. Don't know. Okay, all right, right. So, you know, I have so many really good friends here, um, and uh, and the thing about Texas too, because I just, um, you know, um, I think for those of us who like to come to these things, right? We know, you know, we either we're forced here by our sponsors when we're new, or. <laughs> We just kind of fall in love with this thing, right? And and um, and I think that what you hear here is really a love story about Alcoholics Anonymous, right? And you know, especially in Texas, I know, like I always feel like when I come to Texas, you know, go to Brownwood or you know, for whatever reason, my people are here. Like I love the way AA is here, so I just always feel at home here in Texas. And thank you so much. And um, you know. What a great weekend so far. <laughs> um, Amy last night did such a great job and um, and I guess this is a this is the <laughs> this is the North Texas hooker weekend is what it is. <laughs> well <laughs> now no, that's out of the way. <laughs> I know, Scott, and I'm just, you know, looking forward to Dawn and Fred. So, um, it's just a great weekend. Um, I, uh, you know, I'll say it's, it's funny. We share so many commonalities, but I, I think my mother would be pleased if I let you know that I come from a really good family. Um, <laughs> uh, I am the only alcoholic. I'm adopted, so I, that doesn't really, <laughs> you know, my poor parents, they picked the wrong baby. <laughs> there, there were actually two that day, <laughs> September 30th, 1972, um, and they chose the wrong one. <laughs> I, uh, I had wild red hair sticking up, and um, that, that should have been it. <laughs> <laughs> that should have been the indication, but um, so I am the only alcoholic in my family. I was raised by really excellent parents. They were married forever. They were married 58 years when my mother, I'm sorry, 38 years when my mother died at 58 years old, um, you know, and, uh, um, you know, and I dragged them through some very, very rough times. Um, but I, uh, you know, I, I was raised well. Um, I was raised Roman Catholic, my, um, just a sweet, loving family. But I had this, um, <laughs> I had kind of a weird obsession with alcohol from the time that I was little. And it, it, it only makes sense to us just in looking back, if I could take away the, the alcoholism part of it, which I can't, it just doesn't make any sense to me. But so my first introduction to alcohol was when I was four years old. I had a, an older sister that um, was a little bit of a troublemaker, not an alcoholic, just a little bit of a troublemaker. And, um, and she got me drunk. And, um, and I just remember a few things about it. So one, I idolized my sister. She was five foot, ten and a half, blonde hair, blue eyes, beautiful, surfed. We lived in Los Angeles. And um, I just, I wanted to be like my sister when I grew up. And um, she was not a grown up, you guys. <laughs> she was 12. But <laughs> but when you're four, that's a grown up, right? Um, <laughs> and uh, I remember that um, I liked the taste of beer. I remember I liked the feeling of the dizziness. And then the thing I remember most is that for the rest of my life, my sister would say, my little sister can drink big guys under the table. <laughs> and, um, and I know I wasn't drinking anyone under the table, but that's not what I was hearing, right? And it taught me a few things. One, it taught me my sister was proud of me, which is what I wanted. It also taught me that um, 
that's the goal, right? <laughs> like, that's what they're talking about. Like, you're supposed to be able to drink people under the table. You're not, like, I never changed liquor stores because I was buying too much, right? Like, this is a badge of honor. Um, and so, you know, and, but my parents, um, my parents weren't drinkers. It just wasn't a big deal to them. So I don't remember ever seeing hard liquor in, in our house. Um, my mother would have a, um, <laughs> She would have a glass of red wine at night when she watched Cagney and Lacey or, you know, and, uh, and she drank a uh, gallo red wine just because she was thrifty, right? It was like a big jug and, and she would have, um, and I have a fondness for cheap red wine. I really like it, but she, uh, <laughs> she would have that glass and I would beg her for sips at night and she would hold it and let me just have a little bit. Right. And then my father, when he got home from work, he would drink a bottle of Coors Light. You know, he would sit on the carport and just sit there in his chair with the bottle. And, um, and I would beg him for sips of the beer, and he would hold it and let me just have the foam off it. And, um, and that was it. But, you know, I, I didn't have much exposure to alcohol. I just knew that I wanted sips of it whenever anyone had it around me. Um, my family moved uh, from Los Angeles to the D.C. area when I was eight. And... Um, and uh, when I was 11 years old, um, <laughs> a lot of things changed in my house. So my father had a, 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 a traumatic brain injury. Um, and like Amy, I was my daddy's little girl. Um, and my father was alive for a long time, but um, he was not in his body anymore, right? He was gone. And, uh, and so I lost my father that night. And, um, and uh, my mother was... Uh, understandably occupied with with what was going on she had three children she became essentially a you know widow or a widow overnight and was trying to figure out how to support us and and there were a lot of people coming in and out of the house and as a result of that my house became an unsafe place for 11 year old girls and uh and I lost my connection with God that year and I told my mom about that I didn't tell my mom about what was happening I couldn't talk about that um but I told my mother I didn't believe in God and I remember that feeling and it you know um I love the answers that we have in Alcoholics Anonymous. It makes so much sense to me today that, um, you know, when I think back, I don't, like, prior to that time, I was a happy little girl. I had lots of friends. I was involved in lots of activities. My mom worked really hard to make sure that that happened. I don't remember feeling uncomfortable in my own skin until I was 11. And, uh, and today it makes sense to me that, um, that I would become uncomfortable in my own skin when I lost my connection to God, right? And, uh, and I love what, um, what Carl Jung said to Bill in, in the letters, you know, the letter that they wrote back and forth to each other about Carl Jung's, op and if you don't know what I'm saying, if you're newer, you can Google it and find Carl Jung's letter to Bill, and Carl Jung talks about um, that his observation of, of many men of, he was talking about Roland Hazard's kind, were that they lacked, you know, um, a union with God, essentially, is what he said. And I thought, it's so amazing for a doctor to make that observation of alcoholics. But when I look back, that's what happened. I lost my connection to God. I couldn't feel God anymore. And, um, and my mother started to take me, my Roman, my devout Roman Catholic mother, I mean, very devout, started to take me to other churches, hoping that I might find God in another church, and uh, we went a few places. I remember one of the places we went to was a Byzantine Catholic church. Um, I didn't know the difference, but I loved the pomp and circumstance of it. And then um, my favorite thing is when you got Holy Communion, you got a, um, a spoonful of red wine with a cube of bread in it. <laughs> so when I was 11, I said, that's my church. This is my church. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, and sometime that year... Um, God, I look at pictures of 11-year-olds. I recently found a picture of myself when I was 11. I was like, I was a baby, <laughs> you know, just a baby. But some, you know, later that year, I was uh, at my girlfriend Heather's house, and Heather's parents were out of the country for a, a little while, and her high school sisters were babysitting us. So Heather had a couple of little girls over for a slumber party, and we did whatever 11-year-old girls do at slumber parties. But on Saturday night, I walked into the kitchen, and her high school sisters we're sitting around the table with a bottle that said Seagram 7. 
and I didn't want to hang out with the little girls anymore. I wanted to get drunk with the big girls. And so I put my hands on my hips and I said, you know, I could drink you all under the table. <laughs> and they laughed at me, but they gave me a liter of seven and seven. And, um, and I remember sitting in that, standing up in the kitchen. I remember tipping it back. I remember that it was sweet. It had a hard edge to it, but it was sweet. And I remember just like, glug, 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 like just trying to get it down as fast as I could. And then nothing. <laughs> I've got nothing else for you. All I can, t all I can tell you is how I came to the next morning. And I want to make it clear. There were no boys in the house. Nothing happened to me. Okay. But I came to in the next morning, Heather lived in a three level house in Northern Virginia. <laughs> the basement was unfinished and I came to on a concrete floor in my training bra. <laughs> um, I had no other clothes and, um, I couldn't remember anything from standing in the kitchen, tipping back that bottle. Um, I found my clothes that morning in the hallway, and I had wet myself the night before, so I suppose that's what happened, and, and I was violently ill that morning. <laughs> I was so sick, um, but I could not wait to do it again, and what I did is, uh, is, is I looked for the kids whose parents didn't pay attention, right, whose parents had liquor cabinets. We'd wait till they went to bed, and then we'd make the suicides, right, <laughs> and, uh, and, and just uh, drink, and I, um, you know, I was not a daily drinker at 11, but I have to tell you that it was an important part of my life. And so important that, you know, like some of the other people, um, my mother recognized that I had an unusual relationship with alcohol. And she actually dropped me off at my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous in 1985 when I was 13 years old. Um, I don't know what I was doing there. I wish I'd thought to ask her before she passed. I really do. Um, like, like if it was like a scared straight thing or like what, she, you know, um, or if she just knew I was alcoholic, I don't know. But but I was there. What I thought happened, so I would, from time to time, my mom made me go to AA. I would get in trouble for drinking, and I thought of it like penance. It's like doing penance. I have to do my one meeting, and then I'm off the hook, right? Um, <laughs> I didn't know what AA was. I didn't talk to anybody when I was there, unless there was a young cute boy <laughs> that I would talk to him. But other than that, um, I didn't talk to anybody. I don't remember hearing about sponsorship or the books. And I... I don't know. Someone might have tried to talk to me about that, but I was not, I was not. The one, the only other thing I remember is that um, there was always an adult who would let me have a cigarette, right? And I did like that. So, um, but, but that was it. I, I really had no introduction to Alcoholics Anonymous. It was just the penance I had to do when I got in trouble. And, um, you know, and I, uh, what I felt as I got older, though, um, I like, um, Bill writes, I think it's in the fifth step of the 12 and 12, he, he describes this feeling as anxious apartness. And, um, and I would have never thought of those two words. But I remember, you know, when I was sober and I read that, it was like, yes, like that is the best description. Like not comfortable in my own skin is one way to say it. But anxious apartness is like the most perfect way to describe this feeling. Because as I'm growing up, I have friends. I'm involved in activities. You know, I'm in the drama club. Surprise, surprise. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm a cheerleader, like all of those things. And it looks like, you know, I fit in. But I know that I don't. And I'm obsessed. Like, it's I have a sense of impending doom all of the time. Like I live with a sense of impending doom because I know that as soon as you know me really well, that I will disgust you, right? Like I am not really like you. I am a poser, right? Um, and I just, uh, alcohol fixes that for me. Um, I have another fix and it's switching schools like, <laughs> like Amy did. Um, I like to do that, but, um, I went to three, not four high schools, but I went to three and, um, and I, I became obsessed, so I'm, I feel anxious and apart, and I became obsessed with, uh, with why I felt like this. And the only thing that I could think of was that my family had unfairly moved us from Los Angeles to Northern Virginia. And these aren't my people. My people are L.A. people, not Virginia people, or big city people. If I could move to New York City, I would find my people and fit in. And so... I was obsessed with the idea of going to college there. I went to, uh, I actually got into NYU. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I got to New York University. I was almost 18. It was like a month before my 18th birthday when I started college. And, um, and I was so excited. Now, like, I was having no trouble getting alcohol in the DC area, but it was so much easier in New York. Like there, <laughs> there is no, you don't have to plan, you know, like the find the college guy across the street or drive to Southeast DC to find the, you know, it's like anywhere will set in, in 1990, which is when I went 
to college initially, um, not for very long. <laughs> um, uh, you could buy an, walk in any liquor store and get uh, alcohol in, in, in New York City. And so, so, um, so that semester, we used to have a, a Hank Johnson used to love his talk. He would talk about Groundhog Day, and I would think about, like, this period right there was, like, the start of my Groundhog. That, it was like, there was, like, a season of a Groundhog Day right there because every morning I would wake up. So for you younger people, in the old days, um, you know, you couldn't get your... When you went to college, you didn't get your, you know, syllabi online. You had to go down to the bookstore, and the bookstore kept all the syllabi, and you would get them, and it would list your book and the assignments for the semester. So what happens, I got to New York. The day my mom drove me up to New York, I wouldn't even accompany her back to her hotel room because I was ready to go out and drink. Um, and... Uh, so I was, I was drinking. So every morning I would come to, not morning, <laughs> it was not morning. <laughs> every afternoon I would come to. <laughs> and I would think, tomorrow, tomorrow I'm going to get up early. I'm going to go down to that bookstore. I'm going to get my syllabi. I'm going to figure out what books I need to buy to go to class. I'm going to figure out what assignments I need to catch up on. But since I'm doing it tomorrow, I'm just going to drink one more time, right? Just tonight, I'm just going to let it rip, and then tomorrow will be a whole new day, right? And I just could not get... And here's what happens. You know, um, Scott talked about Clancy the Invisibles. I wasn't sober, but but here's what happens. That happens to me. Like, I am such a fear-based person. The more scared I am, the less I can, you know, the faith... I just love Alcoholics Anonymous for teaching us to just walk through fear, right? The fear doesn't go away. We just learn to walk through and go, oh, it's okay, right? I didn't die, you know? And, uh, but I just could not. It was every morning. It's, it's worse, right? It's further along. I don't even know if I can go to class anymore, right? Will they even allow you to start class, you know, halfway through? I don't know. Um, and so, you know, I'm out of it. I explained to my mother that I was going to be an actress <laughs> and that artists don't need to go to college, so I don't need to go to NYU. And you and um and uh and and I have to say like like I, I you know we often speak eu euphemistically but I was only drinking like that's what alcohol did to me I could not go to college um because of the way that I drank alcohol and um and I um you know so and, and the, the other part of it is I can't hold a job um <laughs> right, because I can't get there. I got a job as a bartender at one point. I was 18, or not, yeah, I was 18, I was 18, and um, I got a job as a bartender. Um, they didn't ID me, <laughs> um, and I just had to be at work at noon, um, and I could not do it. I could not, I mean, sometimes I could. I just couldn't do it every day, right? So I couldn't keep that job, and so went from job to job, and mm, I did end up getting a job on stage, Um my mother was not thrilled with it, though. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and, you know, by the time I was 18 years old, I've, I've entered really what is the dark drinking period of my life, right? I, I am, um, there is no controlled drinking. There is no, um, you know, all I do is live to drink, really. I work, I drink, and that's it. Um, I'm not even having fun anymore, really. And at some point, I realized my life had spun out of control. I thought it was the big city, you know, if I could move back down with my mother in the D.C. area. I, I just need to just need to take a breath for a minute, and then I can come back and, and start over. And so I, I moved back down to D.C., and I have this idea, like, uh, I just need to get back to, like, the fun drinking. You know, the, the funny thing about that, right... <laughs> When I think about it, like, the only time, like, the fun drinking was, like, middle school, climbing out the window, you know, with the bottle of Jack Daniels, meeting my friends in the woods, and we'd all, like, run through the woods drinking, right? <laughs> I mean, there was no, like, I never, um, I had no idea what wine went with salmon, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I, uh, <laughs> I don't, like, I'm not a sophisticated drinker, <laughs> for sure, so, but I have this idea, like, it's just going to be different in D.C. Like, I just need to go back, like, you know, just have a few drinks, just the light, buzzy feeling, and everything's going to be okay. But I can't do that anymore. You know, when I pick up a drink, you know, when, when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, I, I did not believe I was alcoholic. I was sober sometime before I accepted, before I conceded to my innermost self that I was alcoholic. And, um, and what finally got me <laughs> was the realization that, when I pick up a drink, I cannot control how much I drink or when I'm going to stop, right? 
that's my story. It was my story when I was 11, and it was my story when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. And and uh, in a few short months, like Amy, I discovered I was pregnant, um, and uh, and I. Um, you know, I uh, was not sober. Um, but when I found out I was pregnant, I instantly knew. I knew, um, like, I didn't realize I was having a baby. And then I realized I was pregnant, and then I knew I was having a little girl, right? Like, I just felt it immediately, and I thought that she was going to fix my life, right? Like, here was my thought process. I'm going to I'm gonna have this baby. I'm going to be the best mother in the world, right? I will love her with all of my heart. She will love me. I hadn't found my people in New York City. I didn't. I still felt like a poser, but I thought if I had a baby that she would fix that feeling for me, right? That's how I was 19 years old. That's how I matured. That's not a hindsight. Like at the time I thought this baby will make me feel like a whole person and I meant to be a good mother. And I went to a doctor right away and that doctor told me I was two months pregnant, which was disturbing because of, you know, what I'd been doing for the last two months. But but the doctor told me that we still had a heartbeat, so probably everything would be fine. And she asked me if I needed help, and I told her I'd quit four days ago, which was true. And I think, you know, I could have, you could have brought a polygraph in, and I would have passed it that morning. I believed, I believed, you know, that um, I don't know what kind of a woman would get loaded pregnant, but that is not me, right? I am going to be a good mother. I'm going to have a healthy baby, and um, and this is going to fix me, right? And uh, but the thing is, is I'd already lost the power of choice over whether I would drink or not, and I could not, I could not stay sober. I couldn't stay sober, and um, <clears throat> and when my little girl was born, she spent the first 16 days of her life in the neonatal intensive care unit because of the way I drink. Mm. And, um, and unfortunately for her, she was released to me at 16 days old. And, uh, and I meant to stay sober. I stayed sober for three days. I don't even think it was quite sober, but close enough. And, um, but three days later in February in Washington, D.C., we're living in places that have no doors, windows, running water, or electricity, because that's how I live now, right? I, I can't, you know, I drink or I live in the world. Like, I can't do both things. I'm... I'm out of the world. So I lived like that with that little girl for the first uh, nine months of her life. And, you know, what that looked like is um, I would live in a place like that with that with that baby. Um, I got a job in an escort service. And, um, you know, and, and every, every few weeks or few months, I would think I need to do something different. I would call my mom. My mom would take me to detox. She would watch the baby while I was in detox. I would get out. She would welcome me back into her home. And I would, I, I meant to be there. And then I would think, like, well, I could just drive down and get one drink, just one, like, and maybe I'll just get the one drink and bring it back home so I won't have any more than the one drink, and then I'll just drink the one drink and it'll be okay. Um, and I would pack up the baby and I would disappear again, and I don't, I can't have one drink, and so I'd be gone again. And when my daughter was nine months old, um, I went in, uh, I got called in by my escort service and uh, they fired me. <laughs> Because I could not show up to work sober, and they cared. <laughs> and um, I uh, went back to the place I was staying, and um, I told my friend that um, <laughs> that I'd just been fired, and I said, uh, I need to make some money. And well, she knew that, and, uh, and she said, it's not a problem because my brother Buttons is a pimp, and um, we can go down to a payphone and page him, and you can work for him and make some money. And I said, great. I don't think I said great, but, you know, I don't have another idea. <laughs> um, and so we did, and um, Buttons picked me up and took me on a street, and I, you know, I'm not, you know, I think I'm street smart, but not that, <laughs> right? And, um, and this night would have definitely changed the course of my life, and uh, because I got into one car, one car only, and um, I never took the guy's money because we did not agree upon my value. <laughs> And um, and it's a good thing that the negotiations were taking so long because an undercover, you know, car put on lights and asked me to step out of the vehicle. And I stepped out saying, it's not what you think. And um, um, they frisked me. They could not arrest me for prostitution that night because I didn't have a dollar on me. But the police officer told me that if he saw me on site again that uh, on the street, he would arrest me whether I had money or not. I don't think he could do that, actually, but it scared me. Um, <laughs> I uh, did not want to be arrested for prostitution. And, um, and uh, anyways, Buttons told me I was bringing too much police heat. Um, he told me to go home for the night, and um, he would send someone with some money, and, uh, and they didn't come. But So I you know, made the last call of the alcoholic every time I walked down to a payphone and called my mother as she was about to leave for work. 
And when I heard her voice on the line, I was too ashamed to speak to her. So all I said to her was, if you bring me $20, I'll let you have the baby. And, uh, and she was more than happy to come save her granddaughter from me. And, uh, and I, um, I lost custody of my daughter that day. And I'm so grateful for that for so many reasons, but also because I knew my daughter was sick. She had double bronchitis nine months old. My mom immediately took her to a doctor who said she would not have lived a couple of more days. So I am so grateful that that is not, um, I think if that was my story, I wouldn't be here is what I think, but, um, I'm so grateful, but I spent what I hope are the last three and a half months of my drinking. Um, (laughs) I, um, uh, in Baltimore, um, on the, um, on the block in Baltimore, working at a, at a club where they had back rooms for the girls to take the customers to take the girls. And, um, I remember where where I got sober in the DC area, they usually read a portion of chapter three. And I remember hearing that phrase pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. And what Bill is talking about is the pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization of not being able to pick up a drink. Right. But, but I never paid attention. I just remember hearing that phrase, which is an unusual phrase, but one that resonates, I think with alcoholics and it resonated with me. But in that last three and a half months, I miss my daughter's first Christmas, her first birthday, her first words, and her first steps. And um, and uh, my mom tracked me down in early 1994 and offered me a deal. And the deal was this, that uh, she had found an institution that was a year long uh, where mothers could be there with their babies. And if I was willing to go in this institution, I could have custody of my daughter back. And if I turned it down, she would do everything in her power to make sure I never saw my daughter again. And um, I'm so grateful my mother was that mature because I hated her. <laughs> I hated her. Um, and my mom was the best example of how to be a mother to me, um, how to be a grown up, how to be an adult. Right. Um, <laughs> I always felt like sometimes when I talk to, you know, you know, I think like my mother, who's like the same normal adult. Right. Uh, she would she never woke up in the morning and thought, like, should I go to work today? <laughs> like she just went to work. And I think, like, for me, it's always a deliberation, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> so she was such a great example. And, um, and I, I went through detox, and I don't count that in my sobriety, but I got out of detox February 10th, 1994. I was 21 years old, um, and, uh, and I went to that institution that day. My mother brought my daughter to me, and um, my daughter was kicking and screaming and crying for her mommy. She was not talking about me. She no longer knew who I was and didn't want me to touch her, and that's what it looked like on my first day of sobriety. And, um, and you'd think I'd be grateful for the opportunity, but I was not, <laughs> and, um, and uh, that uh, program is still um, around in uh, Vienna, Virginia, and it's still run by the same woman, Bostina, who's not an alcoholic. She just loves us, and she's really good at her job. And I call her every year on my birthday and thank her, and um, she likes to remind me of <clears throat> what a jerk I was. That is not <laughs> not the word she uses. Um, and, um, and she says that it helps her uh, whenever she's dealing with another jerk. Um, she thinks of me and thinks sometimes it works out, so it helps her keep going. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, you're welcome, Vasina. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I went in that institution, and I was there, and um, Vasina used to, we So we got to about two AA meetings a month because it was a federal program, and it was there were a lot of rules around who could watch our children, and so it just was difficult to coordinate that and get us out to meetings. And, um, and I thought two meetings a month was a little excessive. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll let you know if I feel like I need one, but, um, (laughs) and, uh, and Vasina would make me go. And, um, and I, I told her that it was pointless to make me go because once I was out, I'm not, I'm not going to AA. I'm not joining a bowling league. I'm not like any of the lame stuff. No, no, thank you. (laughs) And she said, you know, when I got out, I could do what I want, but while I'm there, but, but what happened is, uh, when I was 11 months sober, I walked into a local Lano club and, um, and, uh, and there was a table there, and I don't know why I looked at it, probably to try to ignore people. Um, but there was a table out that had flyers of local area events. Like I saw one, I think it's right out here, right? There's a table that has other conferences and stuff. And there was a flyer on that table, and there was something. I didn't know what it was, but there was it was going to be a meeting, and there was going to be a spaghetti dinner, and then there was going to be a main speaker, and his name was Sandy Beach. And, uh, and I remembered Sandy because his name was funny, right? And... Um, what I remembered is there was a detox I went through a couple times that used to 
take us to here. Sandy used to live in the D.C. area, and he used to do this 12-step workshop thing on Saturday mornings called Saturday, I think it's Saturday Morning Live. Um, and our, our detox would take us in a druggy buggy to hear him. And I remember, so... Like when I was new, I wanted you all to know that I'm not, I'm not buying into your silly little meetings, right? So what I would try to do, I was like little then, I would try to, I would draw my knees up and sleep during meetings to let you know I'm not interested. Um, <laughs> I'm so glad we didn't have cell phones. I would have been so obnoxious, you know, but I just had me. So um, I can only be <laughs> just as obnoxious as I can be. But, um, but I, something, I, there was one point in one of those days when I was hearing Sandy where something he said made me laugh. And the reason I remember it is because I heard myself laugh out loud and I instantly thought, like, ew, like, don't laugh in AA. That's so lame, you know? So when I was 11 months sober and I saw that funny name, Sandy Beach, what I thought was, that's the man who made me laugh. And I wondered why, like how he could have made me laugh. And I picked up that flyer and I went back to my treatment facility. And for the first time in my life, I asked permission to go to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and they happily granted that. And, um, and I, I went to that thing. It turns out it was for something called Cirque Paw. I didn't know Paw things. I didn't know there were young people in AA. But it was the Southeast Regional Conference of Young People in AA. And, um, and I got to tell you that um, I heard Sandy that night. I don't remember a lick of it, nothing. What I remember is walking into a room like this and there were about 200 young people on fire, right? And, uh, and people had commitments and sponsors and like, and, and people wanted to be there. And I'd never seen anything. <clears throat> you know, our first tradition, the 12 traditions illustrated, I think, and I'm sorry, um, checklist uh, tells us, uh, uh, I'm going to totally paraphrase, but like that we don't make fun of other meetings. And I'm, I'm not trying to do this, but the meetings that I was going to were what I like to call meetings of convenience, which it's like Tuesday, 3 p.m. at the Alano Club. And, and when I say this, there would be no one there who had a commitment. Like the meeting is in the directory, but no one, there's no secretary of the meeting. There's, there's no coffee, like the, the club makes the coffee, right? And whoever is there, you just figure out who has the most time and that person is going to lead the meeting and then it goes in a circle. And usually people talk about their day is what, that, that was my experience with Alcoholics Anonymous. That, and that was pretty much it. Like I didn't know people had jobs, which is really silly now that I think about it because someone puts the chairs out, right? But I, I just, I, I missed that whole thing and here they were. And it was the first time that Alcoholics Anonymous was attractive to me. And, uh, and a bunch of young ladies came and gave me their phone number. And, um, when I, um, when I got out of treatment a couple months later, I, um, I, I actually called them, which I've never done. I mean, obviously, <laughs> um, but like, you know, when I'm out of treatment, I'm free, right? I'm not going to call, but I called and, and these young women asked me to, uh, meet them at, uh, the, um, I think it was like the Hyatt in Boston, um, like in Arlington, Virginia. And, uh, and I showed up that night and, um, and it was, it was a young people's conference and they knew not to ask me for the banquet or maybe the banquet was sold out. I don't know. I didn't have any money. Um, but, uh, but they pulled up a chair to their table and the speaker that night was Karen Garrison from Venice, California, and she was hysterical. And, and then I just started going to meetings with these kids, right? I had a, you know, fear of missing out. And so I went to a meeting the next night with them and I went to the meeting the next night and the next night and the next night. Um, I did not get a sponsor <laughs> though, um, because I knew what sponsorship was intuitively. It's like, asking someone, you know, Amy, will you be my mommy? You know, um, and then, um, I have to ask her permission to do anything. And then if it's fun, she's going to say no. And so like, <laughs> like, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm a grown, I'm 22 years old with 11 months sober, <laughs> you know, I'm a grown up. So, <laughs> um, no, thank you. Um, but this young lady, uh, every day she would ask me, do you have a sponsor? Do you have a sponsor? Do you have a sponsor? I'm like, no, I'm thinking about it, you know? Um, and then finally after about a month, she's like, I'm going to be your sponsor. <laughs> I know Don and Ian, I'll tell you, like if I had lined up every lady in that room, she would have been my very last choice. And, um, <laughs> but she was exactly what I needed. She was, um, because first of all, she was rude. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I don't know what it was cause I was scrappy, but there was something about it. Like she would say something and I wouldn't know how to respond to it. So I shut up. It was the weirdest thing. So like, <laughs> Like, so when I moved out of treatment, um, I moved into the projects. I was on welfare and, you know, subsidized childcare and, you know, what have you with my two-year-old. And, um, 
And uh, and my sponsor told me, now I had been going to a meeting every night, but she told me I had to go to a meeting every night. And I was like, well, I can't because I have a two-year-old. And she said, I did not ask your opinion. <laughs> and I didn't know what to say to that. So I was like quiet for a while. And then I asked her like what I was supposed to do because I kind of, you know, you know, whatever. But the because of my financial situation, when I went to a meeting, my daughter had to go to a meeting with me, and that was it. But somebody also pointed out to me the 12 traditions illustrated, the first tradition, and how, like, you know, like, a, you know, we welcome drunks, but a drunk can't come in and be disruptive to the meeting. that He has to leave, and he's welcome back another time. And I was told the same thing applies to my child. So I'd always be, like, in a back corner near the door, you know. And um, But it didn't take long for my daughter to become what I like to call meeting trained, which is, like, you know, she'd be wild, and then she'd sit. And in D.C., meetings typically typically are an hour. So that was nice. But, you know, she'd sit quietly. And then as soon as the meeting was over, she was wild again, you know, and, uh, and, and that was great. Cause I, you know, got to, got to do meetings and, um, you know, and she, um, and she did it. Now there's a couple of things. So I was on welfare and I, um, I did not get sober and like feel great. Right. <laughs> Um, it wasn't like I looked around and I, I saw all of you in the meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous and your lives are going splendidly. Everyone here is comfortable in their own skin. It's all great. And, um, but it's not happening for me. What is the difference between me and you? Um, it's that you guys have money and I don't, <laughs> right? I mean, obviously none of you live in the projects, right? None of you. So that's the difference. And I think if I could just make some money, I would, you know, feel all right. And then I remembered that I know how to make money. And, um, and so, you know, with a year sober, I went back to work for an escort service. And, um, and what happened for me over the next few months, uh, Scott talked about it a little bit. Um, I like to say, like, the, like, really the best description I have of it is that it ate my soul, right? So I had it logically worked in my head. You know, we're all consenting adults. Why is this illegal anyway? Uh, my sponsor said I live like ready, fire, aim, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Uh, should I talk to my sponsor about this? Absolutely not. My sponsor won't understand any of this. And, you know, the thing is, what I've discovered about this is, is in order for me to do that, like if, if I have to keep a secret from you, I have to build a case against you as to why you don't understand. And um, if I build a case against you, I am not part of you. I cannot be part of you. And so um, I, I, uh, my experience is get a best friend because <laughs> it's always easier to tell the best friend before the sponsor. <laughs> and once you tell the best friend, then you have to tell the sponsor, right? So, you know, it's always held me in good stead. But, but I went to my sponsor, and what happened is um, I was about 18 months sober, and I actually surrendered in Alcoholics Anonymous for the first time. I was like... The thing is, I didn't trust my sponsor, but at 18 months of sobriety, I was certain about one thing, that my sponsor could not possibly do a worse job of my life than I was doing myself. <laughs> and that was all I needed to, to, you know, turn myself over to my sponsor. And so, and I said, direct my life, tell me what to do. I don't know what I'm doing. And I didn't know that that's the answer, right? <laughs> that it's surrender. It didn't matter. She could have asked me to do cartwheels five times a day. Didn't matter what the answer was. What mattered is I was willing to follow my sponsor's direction. And, um, and so, and, and one of the things <laughs> she told me to do at the time was, um, she told me, so I was like one of those people that if you um, asked me how I was, I would, uh, I would always cry <laughs> and, and, um, and I would suck the life out of you while I was telling you about my, <laughs> my, you know, my sad life. And, um, and my sponsor told me that um, I was no longer allowed to tell anyone how I was. Um, <laughs> she told me I was going to lie. Um, and uh, uh, when someone asked me how I was, I was to smile and um, pretend to be happy and say, I'm fine. Thank you. And then she gave me some questions you ask people when you pretend like they're, you're interested in their life, like, which I had not been doing. I mean, if you ask me about me, it's all me. Right? I'm not going to, how was your day at work? You know, what did you do today? Um, anyway, so I started putting a smile on my face and pretending to be a happy person. And, um, and I, you know, before then, life had felt so heavy. But I don't know where... I don't know where it happened, but I know at some point, six months, a year, nine months, I don't know when it was, but I realized that life didn't feel heavy anymore, that, that, that my sponsor had actually trained me to uh, disease of perception, right, to look at life differently, act better than I feel, and wow, it worked, right? And, um, and uh, you know, she also, you know, the other thing is I was taught to, to show up, right, to be where I say I'm going to be when, I'm gonna, when I say I'm going to be there. And... Uh, 
if you'd asked me to write a list of what I wanted to be when I grew up or, or what I wanted, you know, um, like if you asked me to write a list of my goals, I would have shortchanged myself for sure. And uh, my big goal um, at 18 months sober was to not live in the project someday. That was it. And I did not think that it would be possible for someone like me to get out of the projects until my child was 18 years old, right? Like that was it. And, um, but I decided to try a uh, junior college and I thought I'd never been a good student, but I thought if I went to a junior college, I could get a two year degree, maybe find some kind of job where I could get out of, you know, the projects. And so I went to junior college. Um, and what happened is I showed up on time, right? I did my homework. I I asked the professor questions when I didn't understand, and there was a lot I didn't understand, right? Um, I was the only one handing in handwritten papers because I didn't have access to a computer, you know? Like, there, there was that stuff, but they were so good to me. And every semester, I got straight A's, and I was like, oh, my God, who is this? You know, like, I couldn't believe it. And, and at the end of two years, my school counselor sat down with me and said to apply to college. And I thought, like, a girl like me, like, I didn't think girls like me went to college. And I, I asked him if I should apply to the state school, and he was like, Yvonne, you can go anywhere you want to go. And and he helped me apply, and I ended up <clears throat> getting an academic scholarship to study at the George Washington University in Washington, D.C., and um, I went there for, for two years, and um, still going to meetings every day, because my sponsor told me I was too crazy to take a night off, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I worked part-time, you know, but I'll tell you, it taught me to be very efficient with my time, and I have to tell you, it has been such a blessing to learn those efficiencies in Alcoholics Anonymous, but um, I am... Um, Two years later, I got to graduate first in my field, and my mom got to sit on the White House lawn and watch that happen with my five-year-old daughter in her lap, and I'm so grateful for that because my mom was diagnosed with cancer a couple of months later, and, and she died really quickly, um, but she lived long enough to see me you know, have five years of sobriety, and she told me that she knew that her granddaughter was safe in my custody because of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm so grateful. Um, sorry. I'm just so grateful because my mother was like the most stellar mom I could have ever had. So I'm so grateful she got to see that. Um, and what an example she was to me. Um, she also got to see me start my first year of law school. And um, you guys, I'm, I'm a practicing litigator at one of the largest law firms in the world now. And I get some... <laughs> It is insane to me, right? I just, I cannot, um, I cannot believe. Um, and the thing is, like, so it's funny. Like, I was just in Chicago at, um, at another office meeting with our COO a couple weeks ago. And um, so, like, I've learned not to cuss in AA, I, 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 but I don't cuss from the podium, right? So, like, I learned, I just was taught that new. And um, so I've just carried that over to work also. Like, you know, privately, I cuss, but... At work, I don't. And they keep making comp. They think I'm like this, like, churchy person because they're like, oh, I noticed that you never cuss. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> like, I'm like, they have the wrong idea about me, you guys. <laughs> like, really wrong. But, but I am so grateful for that. And I, you know, I got to raise that little girl. I mean, Don and Ian have known her since she was, uh, like, seven or eight years old when I moved from Los An uh, from D.C. to Los Angeles and uh, running around Clancy's yard and um, and then she gave me a run for my money also <laughs> and, um, and I, I'm so grateful for my mother's example of um, of how to be an effective parent right I was not as good as my mother nowhere near I could never touch it but I had her example and it was great and and uh, and my daughter uh, ran me ragged and then came to me um, in uh, July of 2008 to tell me that she was 30 days sober in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and I was so grateful and. She was 15 years old, and that is her, her sobriety date is June 21st, 2008. So I recently celebrated 28 years. She celebrated 14 years, and um, we attend the same meetings, and she's on fire with Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm so grateful for that. I am so grateful. Um, you know, without you guys, I could have missed it all. And um, um, our, our book, Alcoholics Anonymous, when it talks about the stories, it says that each each uh, teller, and I'm paraphrasing, tells in his own way how he s establishes relationship with God. And I feel like 
I just want to tell you guys uh, how that happened to me because I came here. I, I grew up agnostic from 11 on, as I told you, and um, I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, and that didn't change. And I knew that most of you all seemed to believe, but I could not feel God. And um, when I was uh, two and a half years sober, I had a, a really bad accident where I accidentally uh, clipped off a big chunk of cornea. I'm sorry. It's gross. And, um, and it would not heal over months. Over several months, I went blind in my eye. I'm still blind in my left eye. And um, I went from eye doctor to eye doctor to eye doctor. Um, I ended up having to travel every day to go to the Johns Hopkins University because they have a really incredible eye institute there. And um, my mother would drive me every day. And, um, and, uh, and at one point, I had to put eye drops in my eye every half an hour, 24 hours a day for over a month. And I did not have to set an alarm clock for 30 minutes because the physical pain was so incredible, I could not sleep that long. I was out of my mind is what I was. And, um, and, and this, a few months into it, um, I was at the Wilmer Eye Institute on a Saturday night, and my doctor, Terrence O'Brien, told me, Yvonne, there is nothing more we can do for you. 50-50, you're going to lose your eye altogether in the next week. And I was totally devastated by that information. But I was also, I also felt like I cannot go 24 more hours in the kind of physical pain that I am in right now. And I made a decision that the next day I was going to go into Southeast DC to get some opiates because opiates are pain blockers, right? I just need something. I need some relief from, I cannot go any longer in the physical pain I'm in. But my mom dropped me off at my Saturday night meeting. And, and, uh, and my first sponsor came up to me that night unsolicited and offered some information to me, which was that I needed to go home and pray for the removal of the obsession I had with my eye. <laughs> I've never hated anyone more than I hated her. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> this is not an obsession. <laughs> this is, um, but I was wrong. She was right. Um, because yes, I had a physical malady, but I also had an obsession with it is what happened. So I went home, um, and I was seething. Like, it was like one of those, you know, where you're so mad at someone, you find yourself screaming out loud and you're like alone, you know, <laughs> I was like that mad. I was just seething for a couple of hours. But this voice in, in the back of my head kept saying, like, just take the action because I'd learned take the action. Right. But I'm like, no, that's stupid. Just take the action. Stupid. And finally, I think like just to shut my head off, I'll take the action. And I get down on my knees and I said, I don't know what I said, but it was something like, God, please remove the obsession I have with my eye, whatever, <laughs> you know. And um, and I crawled back up into bed and I fell asleep. Um, but I woke up six hours hours later and I had not slept a night. Um, it had been over a month since I had been able to sleep through a night. And I remember when I got up that morning, first of all, I saw light and I was like, wait, you know, it's morning. And then immediately I recognized that I was no longer in pain. I mean, a little bit, totally tolerable, not pain, not pain, just a little discomfort. And then I thought, I'm not in pain. And I woke up that morning and I stood in my room and I, I was still in the projects and there's like the cheap welfare blinds, you know, that you can't get the dust off. But like when the sun comes through, it is so beautiful, right? But I remember looking at that and just thinking, I just remember feeling like my chest expand. It's, it's joy is what it is. To me, joy and God feel the same. Like that is the feeling. And I just remember like... This is what it felt like. That feeling I knew I'd had as a child that I had lost. It was the first time that I had it again. And, um, and my mom picked me up that day and I saw Terrence O'Brien, that, my doctor that day. And, um, and he said he had no medical explanation for the healing that had occurred in my, in my eye overnight. And, um, and, and I, I received what I think is the greatest gift that morning, which was that feeling, right? Like God is a thing I work on now, but that feeling was a gift, right? It was a grace thing. But I also think that I learned what, what is the greatest lesson in my sobriety. Because you guys, when that was happening, I felt really, really sorry for myself. I thought it was terrible. I was like trying to go to college at the time and it was bad. And what I deemed to be a bad thing, I received that, that precious gift of grace. And so it taught me that I'm, I, I can no longer judge what is good or bad in my life. And that does not mean that I skate gracefully through the bad times, but it does mean that I stay because I know like, even when it feels terrible now, and it feels like this should not be happening. I have this voice that says, Yvonne, it is always okay. Everything always works out. And you never look back and think, Oh, if it had gone my way, it would have been better. Right? <laughs> so, um, you know, I am so grateful to you guys for everything, you know, um, you know this from where I came from when I got here tonight, that everything good in my life today is a direct result of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'd like to thank you.
much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.